Welcome to our April meeting. The bagels that you see off on the side aren't really bagels, they're really matzo in the So hopefully you guys are gonna enjoy the bagels even more. Uh, Passover is over. Passover is over, yes. Uh, new members and guests, I know we have at least one. Mr. Gerber, where are you? Why don't you stand up and just give us a one minute who you are. I've lived in Cherry Hill for about 35 years over the Woodcrest section. Uh, I have one son, he graduated from Cherry Hill East. Uh, he now lives in Chicago. A girlfriend, that's a good thing. And uh, they play basketball. We're dressed like this, I played this morning, and Steve invited me to come see the group. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> Do we have any more uh, guests, new members? No? Okay. Uh, before before we do the mozi, shh, before we do the mozi, I'd like to have about a one minute regarding the uh, California synagogue episode that happened over the weekend, where unfortunately uh, one woman was killed and uh, two or three people were injured as a result. Three were injured. I'm sorry. Right. Last I heard, three were injured. Okay. okay. Uh, one of them I know is a rabbi. So if we just take one minute. Okay. But okay. Um, Shalom Achad Bavad Amad Aleinu Lavoseinu Allah Shevachol Dov Vedor Om Mudim Aleinu Lechalosenu. For not just one alone has risen has risen up against us to destroy us. But in every generation, they rise up against us to destroy us. That's from the Haggadah, from, Pes from Pesach. I also want to mention that um, tonight at 6 o'clock, the Chabad of Camden and Burlington counties will host a South Jersey communal gathering reflecting on, today, on yesterday's attack. Everyone is welcome. So again, 6 o'clock, that's a Chabad on Crescent Road. Thanks. Thank you. So just one moment, and then we'll continue on. Okay. Before we do the mozi, and just to ensure that the people who have some physical disabilities, as well as guests going up, like you, the guests as well as the people who have some physical disabilities, to get to the table first so they don't get run over. We had about 20 to 25 people who helped out at the law enforcement breakfast and uh, those who are here that were part of the preparation, I'd like you guys to stand. And thank you all very much. Mike, do you, Mike, you have anything you want to talk about for the law enforcement breakfast? Thanks, Marty. Law enforcement at breakfast, again, was, was very, very successful. We had close to 200 people there, uh, mostly from the police chief associations of uh, Camden, Burlington, Gloucester, and Salem counties. Uh, the keynote speaker did a marvelous job, was from the attorney general's office, and uh, it did a lot for the relations law enforcement, senior law enforcement, and the Jewish community, and we've done it for quite a few years. And I want to thank all of you for making it such a success. Um, now, we also do a 50-50 and gave money to the Heroes Scholarship Fund and the Holocaust Education Center and Museum. Um, we don't just give them the proceeds from the 50-50, but we also, if we have any profit left, we call them back to a meeting and make an additional donation. So far, we've donated to those two groups in excess of $5,600. So, well done. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I thought the event was very well organized, the law enforcement breakfast, and that's really because of the efforts of Rich, Mike, and Bob, and I think they should be recognized. Thank you, Bob. 
especially because of the hours that they showed up at. Even, even the roosters don't get up that early. <laughs> okay, uh, Yoma show is on Wednesday the 1st at Temple Emmanuel, and we are always there to help out by distributing candles. And Rich, you have anything you want to add? Or? It's, this, uh, it's, it's this Wednesday at Temple Emmanuel. The uh, program starts at 7, but if you can help out and get the candles ready, here are the candles that we hand out. Um, to no charge for everyone who comes. Uh, we do take donations. Um, I'd like you to be there around 5, 30, 6 o'clock so we can get everything set together. Plus we help, help out if they need ushers and getting people to their seats and things of that sort. So if we can get there like 5, 30, 6 o'clock, it would be much appreciated. Um, South Jersey Men's Club is also offering um, transportation to seniors who can't get there. Um, interesting, I was just thinking, today is the 27th, 28th. 28th. Uh, the cutoff date was the 24th, and I have gotten no responses yet from the JCC. So apparently, if I hear anything at the last minute, I'll send out a quick email. So uh, if you can help, uh, it would be much appreciated. Um, and Ed? Um, as you probably know from the emails that I've been sending out, uh, the club usually sponsors the cost of the candles. And uh, every year we've pretty much been able to cover the cost of the candles. Uh, to date, um, we're about 80% there. Um, we asked if you want to contribute, I mean, a case of candles is 72, uh, half a case is 36, 18 is a quarter of a case, uh, whatever you want to give. Uh, if we had uh, four or five more people who would donate 18, we'll, we'll be over the top. So I'm around, you can make your checks out to JCRC, uh, that's tax deductible. Um, so, and you can mail them to me or you can bring them in the night of Yamashoa. Uh, whatever. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, why, you know, just business casual. No shirts, no blue shirts. Thank you. Mike, where are you again? Science Museum? A trip to the Science History Museum will be sometime next month probably on a Tuesday and it's just chance of on a Thursday. They haven't gotten back to me yet. They definitely want to do it for us. Uh, that will include a guided tour. Minimal cost, a few dollars. And um, a special tour, a uh, special kind of like lecture telling us about all the, the many things that the Science History uh, Museum and Institute do. And uh, sometimes they'll have like Nobel Prize winners come and, and do speeches and things. It's, it's quite interesting. And I think we included when Nelson and I did the presentation about working on an army base in Israel, they, we included pictures of the Science History Museum and some of the things that they do. And um, you'll get information shortly. Once I find out, you'll find out. And of course, this is wife's invited. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Our Greenberg Winery Tour. Hey, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to be passing out a sign-up sheet to get an idea of how many people want to attend a uh, wine tasting. Uh, to answer the question that has been raised, probably there will not be food available, in other words, eat first whenever we do it. Um, they'll probably have crackers and cheese and that type of thing, but that's about it. Figure that it will run at least $15 a head. The only thing we have to decide is whether we want to try to do it on a weekend or on a weekday early evening. So uh, we'll pass out the sheet. Then we'll, then, then we'll con consult with the winery and see what they can actually do, and we can go from there. What uh, winery? Amathea, that's in Atco. They're one of the few wineries in the state of New Jersey that does what they call old style uh, vin venting. Uh, they age their wines, and their wines have stood up against both the California wines and the French wines. And they've actually had 
representatives from the House of Margot show up, taste the wine, buy cases to bring back with them because they thought it was at least as good as theirs. And if you've ever looked at a, at a, at a Margot, you're talking $1,000 a bottle. So we have some gems in the state of New Jersey. We have four or five really good old style wineries. You have one up in North Jersey, Beneducci. You have one in Cape May, Turdeau. You have Amathea, and there's a couple of others. And these are well, if, if you like wine tasting, they're worth the trip to taste their wines. They are very well done. Turdeau specializes in Italian varietals, and they're usually completely sold out by October. Beneducci, uh, the winemaker there, is a Cornell graduate. He does a lot of Cornell clones, and he does a lot of New York State vintages uh, such as uh, Rieslings, but he also makes some excellent red wines. And like I said, this is old style, so you can take those bottles and you can age them, and you don't have to worry about them going bad. Unlike the newer, the, the wineries that do new style, new style is not intended for aging. You buy it, you, you drink it, you're done with it. Okay? Any other questions, guys? All right, we're going to start up here, pass it out, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Bob, do we age the same way as wine? <laughs> <laughs> we don't tell people these things. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, the bylaws of South, oh, excuse me, South Jersey Men's Club uh, requires that the board make a presentation at our April meeting for the prospective offices for the following two years. Uh, essentially, we will present the names at this meeting and we will be voting at the next meeting. Obviously, between now and the next meeting, if you have, you would like to, uh, appear on the ballot, if you want to call it that. All you have to do is get in contact with me. This is just to think about the individuals that we are uh, presenting to the membership. So I'm going to make the announcement for the individuals, and I'd like them to uh, stand up, just in case you don't know them. President will Ed Stein. Sit down, Nate. <laughs> President-elect is Phil Godorov. He's downstairs right now on a boomer uh, yeah. involvement downstairs, so he couldn't make the breakfast. <laughs> Treasurer, Stan Schumas. <laughs> VP of External Affairs, Rich Moskowitz. VP of Operations, Dave Schwartz, who is right now uh, on a walk for cancer. <laughs> Director of Membership, Rob Levine. <laughs> VP of Communications, Randy Acorsi. <laughs> Media Director, Dave Nidoff. And VP of Religious Affairs, Rob Sachs, who could not attend the, the meeting this morning. To all of you, thank you very much. Good luck in, the, in your upcoming term, assuming you don't have any challenges. Okay, we have two new members whose tags I have Mark Popovo. Mark, is he, are you here, Mark? Oh, okay. Mark Povo. No, he's not here. And uh, Gene Novak. Gene, okay. yeah. Come on up. Come on up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Gene? Congratulations. 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 Anything, anything you want to say? 
No. Yeah, well, thank you for this gold. Uh, <laughs> now, you, now you know who you are. I'm trying to live up to your standards. They're pretty low. Well. No, no. <laughs> thank you. Alright, uh, anybody, uh, anybody have a prospective member coming to the next meeting? Uh, anybody have a prospective member coming to the next meeting? I have plenty of applications. Uh, please mention it whenever you're around fellow Jews, even if they're not, sometimes they might want to join, but don't have any problems with that. So, uh, look forward to seeing you guys again next month. Thank you, Nick. Do you have a good idea? Okay, uh, Marcy will have uh, from the senior services for us. She uh, asked us to mention that they do have the boomers have festivities fair going on downstairs, and most of us are baby boomers. And they're going to have uh, seminars uh, talking about how we could get benefits. They could also, they're also going to give us opportunities for medical care. Yeah, talking about things of that type. It starts at 11.30. Even if we're not done by 11.30 in this meeting, she wants us to come down if you have an opportunity and just see the booths, listen to the speeches that are still remaining. One other thing is uh, some uh, people in this room have asked me about veterans benefits. I uh, printed out a forum uh, concerning two people I think are really great certified veteran services officers. Uh, if you want a copy of their, their Contact information, please come up to me after the meeting. I'd be happy to give it to you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Okay, um, with Dave not being here, he sent me his little speech that I will now try to read. I would like to introduce Dr. Scott Yorka, who is a member of the South Jersey Events Club. Yay. Scott is a chiropractor here at the Jewish Community Center. He received his doctorate degree from Life Chiropractic School 23 years ago. Dr. Yorker is also nationally board certified in psychological therapeutics. Physiological. Uh, physiological. Oh, physio. I can't read. Physiological. 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 Psychological, too. All, all I did is I missed the Y. Okay. For, for us, psychological. And holds a BS degree in exercise science. Dr. Yorker has a unique approach of combining a host of natural solutions towards the correction of chronic back and neck pain and a host of other sports related injuries to the wrist, shoulders, hips, and knees. Uh, in May, he'll be celebrating the second year of his office being here at the JCC. His program has been seen on local NBC television and Health Time TV with Sanjay Gupta. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Scott Yorker. First question I have, can you hear me without this? Yeah. I can. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. If I start to bubble, let me know. Yeah. Um, thanks for the introduction. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I know you came to those things a lot. So. <laughs> um, I decided to pick a class that's designed around what we're all doing here today, which is sitting. Right? Um, my background is in chiropractic. I had a lot of sports injuries, mostly from uh, motorcycle injuries in the past. <laughs> All right. So what we're going to go through today is proper ergonomics in a sitting position. Let me see. Um, how many people spent? Yeah, can you bring the lights down a little bit in the back, at least in the front? How many? Ah, OK, everyone go to sleep now. How many of you guys spend more than eight hours a day sitting? Okay. All right. So, as you know, how many people spend more than eight hours a day sleeping? So, so, so we're sitting. We're sitting. How many people are sitting and sleeping? <laughs> how many people fell asleep already from this program? The uh, so we spend a th most of us are spending at least a third of our day sitting, right? Um, Sitting actually can be hazardous to our health, is really what it comes down to. Um, we're in the car, we're eating dinner, we're eating breakfast, uh, we're on the computer, we're watching a movie, and over time this can actually become a problem. Um, is everybody familiar with the term ergonomics? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, basically reducing ergonomic stress is really what will um, 
take away from what from the from the detriment that seeding can cause. Um, the actual scientific definition, Webster's definition, is er it's ergonomics is the scientific engineering of an object or an environment intended to maximize productivity while minimizing fatigue. It basically means you want to make the environment stop you from causing or creating problems that are really unnecessary to have. I, I, as an example, I've had a lot of patients, again, I've been doing it for 23 years, and um, I do programs here all the time. In fact, I'll be in the Boomers. If anybody wants to be screened today, I'll be checking people downstairs in that Boomers program in the back corner um, next to Patty, who's going to be doing free massages all day long. So you guys might want to line up and come down and get that checked out. She's excellent if you haven't had her work on you. She works across the hall from me. A lot of you guys um, don't know that in May will be my second year of actually having a chiropractic center here at the JCC. I mean, I'm actually in this location. I'm on the second floor. If you guys came up the steps, I'm right there. We're what they call the spa area, right in that area. And, um, but I have a lot of patients that have done like um, union jobs. As an example, I take care of seniors, take care of infants, but I got a lot of guys that are, that are union guys, especially in my office in Philadelphia, which I have another location in Philly. Um, and you hear these union guys, they're like, you know, they're working on the, on the ships, on the docks, steel workers doing heavy manual work, plumbing. And a lot of them talk about how they're looking forward to the day of having a desk job. Stick with the program long enough, they're gonna have a desk job. These guys are really healthy, many of them, and then they get to the desk job moment. And the desk job ends up as being the time when, they, when their health starts to decrease. And so today what we're gonna do is learn how to actually sit in a chair safely, ergonomically, and, uh, and then we're gonna go through some exercises that you can do while seated. Um, I gave you guys all, if, if you didn't pass them around, I left on everyone's table eight um, brochures which goes over some tidbits of things that you can do. It's kind of a review of what we're going to go over today. I used to give out these big packs, but I thought one page would be a best move so you guys can hang on to it, something small that you can hang on to. Um, there's also a survey there. Um, and, then, and then some business cards if you guys need. And if you, and if you, don't, end up, you, if you don't end up using them, just leave them behind. I'll pick them up at the end. The um, survey that I have here, Everybody can kind of take out. I left some pens on the desk. If you, you only really need to fill this out. Um, there's a couple different ways that I set up uh, the way for you guys to actually see me here. Um, one, I put appointment cards in the back on that table all lined up that make like a first consult in my office no cost if you guys wanted to come in. Um, however, for boomers, everybody over 65, I'm in network with Medicare, so everyone in this, in this facility, if you have Medicare, you probably have 100% coverage to see me. 100% if you have the right secondary, which is pretty much all the secondaries. Um, and that's kind of nice to know. Some, two, there's like two reasons, well three reasons why people sometimes don't come in my office for problems. One, is they're afraid they're gonna get hurt or they have to keep on coming. Like it's actually, they're actually scared of it. Um, another is that they don't have enough time and another is that it costs too much. So cost wise, I put together appointments for consults that are back there that you guys can fill out. I line them all up so they're real easy. You just look at the time. Put your name and number on the bottom half, tear the top, take it with you. I take all the bottom halves and put them in the schedule book. Um, but you, whether you do the free console or not, you guys have coverage for me anyway. Um, time, I'm here till 9 p.m. on Mondays and Wednesdays. So I actually have late hours. I'm here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I work all day. And then safety-wise, I actually brought some with me. When people think of chiropractors, again, I do chiropractic and physical therapy. When people think of chiropractors, um, they often think, what's the first thing you think of when you think of a chiropractor? Back. 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 Makes sense, right? Does anyone know what chiro means? What chiropractic means in Latin? Does anyone know what practic means? There's a lot of things that end in practic. Is that the capital of Egypt? Ah, I don't know. Is that in your denial? <laughs> right. The, um, chiro means hand. So it actually means, practic means to practice by. So chiropractic means to practice by hand. Uh, I originally had a knee injury. I do a lot with ankles, knees, wrists, shoulders, hips. So not just back. Uh, I brought a plastic spine. This is a plastic spine of a 5'9 man. So this is actually life size of a 5'9 man. Uh, how tall are you? About that. About that? <laughs> You want to no, I'm just up? kidding. No, you can sit actually. As he's sitting here, you can kind of see here's the back of the head. You can see the back of the head there where he's sitting. They're about the same height. So literally, this is the, the height of a 5'9 of a man. Um, as far as 
a lot of people when they think of chiropractic, they think of like cracking and snapping and popping and, 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 and crunching bones, so to speak. Uh, the sound that you hear is a gas that escapes from the joint. Uh, but I also am certified in a technique that's called Impulse IQ. I brought one with me. Uh, I'll show it to you now since I brought it up. The, um, and it's the only electric instrument that met. It looks like a gun, so nobody gets scared. <laughs> It's the only electric instrument that Medicare has ever approved. Um, the guy that invented this, Chris Coloca, I went to school with, um, he has close to 300 published articles now in the development of this instrument. Um, not only in um, chiropractic journals, but also osteopathic JAMA and, and physical therapy. So it's actually one of the few techniques that's gone throughout all three fields. Physical therapy, osteopathy, which is what DOs are, old school DOs at least, they used to do the manipulative stuff. And of course chiropractors that do adjustments, typically by hand. What Chris Coloca did was he actually had some volunteers that were alive. He had their spine completely open. <laughs> they didn't look like this. <laughs> He had their spine completely opened up, exposed, where he tapped pins into this part of the spine called the spinous process, so that he could actually figure out how much force it was going to take to get those bones moving. But not just moving, but moving in such a way that it wiggles, meaning the instrument is not going to punch into it hard. It actually, he had figured out how many cycles per second it takes so that when it moves, it kind of wiggles like this to the bone, not punches into it. And he, he measured when he was, say, on a certain vertebra in the middle, we'll say thoracic number seven. He figured out how much force it would take for number seven to move, but while on number seven, that five and six would also move with it. And then four and eight would move, meaning as he pushed on one, the bone above it and below it moved, and the bone above it and below it moved to create that wave so that everything starts to move almost like a domino effect from just affecting the one tightest spot. He also had EEGs on the brain, EMGs on the nerve, needles in the disc, and then sensors on the organs. And when everything lit up, so a lot of chiropractic is talking about, not only, within chiropractic we talk about uh, increasing the motion in the spine, but we're really looking to reset neurological problems. See, the brain and nervous system control everything in our body. And if the nerves are inside vertebrae that aren't moving properly, there's a chance that the impulses are being impeded upon, and then whatever that nerve goes to may not function as well. Like if it happens to be L4, L5, S1, and S2 at the bottom of your spine, that could create tension that causes something called sciatica, shooting down the leg. If it happens to be number six, uh, number six it could go down to the median nerve and cause what's called carpal tunnel syndrome. If it happens to be number seven it can, and, and eight, it can go down to the ulnar nerve and call Guyan tunnel syndrome. If it's number five, it can go to the shoulder and cause a shoulder problem. If it's number one and two, it can come up into the head. You get the concept, I think. Um, lumbar number one does the upper thigh. Lumbar number two does the mid thigh. Lumbar number three does close to the knee and four into the knee, four, L4 down to the side of the leg. Each nerve goes to a different spot on the skin is what I'm leading to, and controls each organ. So he not only figured out how much force it would take to reset and bring motion into the spine, but light up that whole neurological loop, meaning he lit up the brain at that neurological level. He lit up the organ at that neurological level. He lit up the nerve. He lit up the disc. So the entire nerve loop had like a reset moment. And so it's a very safe, gentle, that doesn't crack or pop. And then in here, built into this instrument, the newest one here called the Impulse IQ, is a meter. So for instance, I could set, every, anyone ever hear of uh, Isaac Newton? Not Fig Newton, Isaac Newton. He discovered like gravity, right? And it was one of, he had three main laws, you know. His first law was the law of inertia, which is like when something, when an object, it's like how satellites work. When an object is set in motion, it'll continue in motion until something acts upon it. It's that inertia feeling when you go down a roller coaster kind of feeling. Number two is force equals mass times acceleration. And number three is every action has an opposite reaction. You guys maybe remember some of this in physics class. It's like basic physics. Well, meters per second squared is forces, meaning the mass times the acceleration creates a force. Forces are adjust, adjustments are forces. Okay, so I could set this for 100 newtons of force, 100 meters per second squared, 200 newtons of force, or 400 newtons of force. The safety feature in it is that if I happen to set 400 newtons of force, which typically is what the low back would take if you didn't have osteoporosis or anything that's a problem in the low back, and it recognizes that something's not able to handle that much force, like for instance if it's just my finger on the end expecting something heavy, you may be able to see that it'll 
go orange. I don't know if you can see that from far away, but it has a light on here that goes orange. It tells me wrong force. You overpowered the area. If I go too light and I put it on an area that expects heavy, it'll go orange. But if I can match it, so that light goes with the right light, it'll go green. You see how that goes green on there? And then it'll slowly increase until it moves. So basically this instrument is a very safe way to adjust the spine without cracking, without snapping, without popping, but affects the entire neurological loop in an area where the bones aren't moving properly. It's kind of cool, right? Has anyone ever seen one of these before? One, two, three, four, okay. And it's relatively new. Uh, the, the technique itself has been around for almost 20 years. This instrument I think has been around for about seven. I've been using it for five. And I thought I'd bring that along with me because a lot of times people think about chiropractic, they just think about cracking and popping and snapping and stuff like that. Um, the beginning, let's talk about how sitting and why sitting can become such a problem. First of all, if you spend a third of your life doing anything, it can create dominant patterns, right? So if you're doing eight hours or more, that's a third of your life. But sitting also has something very close to what our poor posture would be like when, uh, when, I always forgot, when, when we were born, there was something called a fetal curve, meaning your head was like curved into one curve down towards your toes, right? Everyone knows that like a fetal curve. And when we sit slouched, it's almost the same curve. That's why our body can eventually become used to that poor posture by doing something that we think is relaxing. It's kind of interesting, right? Because you think of like, I'm tired, I want to sit down, right? Has anyone heard of like standing desks recently? That's like a new rage, like standing desk. Uh, does anyone think that's a great idea? No. Yeah. Why, is that, why is it a bad idea? I like to sit down. I like to sit down there. Right. I remember seeing the first time I saw uh, Seinfeld, and I promise not to try to be like Seinfeld, uh, when he did his first um, uh, stand-up after the show ended. I think he did it at the Academy of Music or something like that. And he did a whole skit on like, why would you ever do something standing when you could do it sitting? the hierarchy of this. And then why would you ever do something sitting if you could do it lying down? And you did like the whole skit the, about that. Um, one of the main reasons why standing desks are so uh, popular now is because the person that invented it or really thought about it realized that most of us are sitting while we're at work. If everybody stood at work, guess what the newest invention would have been? Sitting. Exactly. So the most important part about a standing work, a standing, a standing desk is to be aware of if you're sitting a long time to take breaks. If you're standing at work a long time, guess what you should do as your break? <laughs> Sit. Right. Real basic like that. So I want to talk about the quick beginning of anatomy here. We have this fetal curve, right? So we're bent like this when we're first born. And we usually crawl before we walk, right? And when you start to crawl, for instance, if I was crawling along here, looking down, and I bang into a wall, one day I may decide maybe I should look up when I crawl, right? First time you're crawling in your entire life as a baby. So you crawl looking up. What happens? You start to develop the proper curve in your neck, meaning there's supposed to be a curve when you look at your neck from the side. And if you don't develop that curve properly, the neck will be too straight. This is the beginning of neck problems that we'll talk about in a moment. When you start to walk, and there's initially this curve like this, and you get to this point, eventually what happens is you create your lumbar curve. And then a perfect curved spine will look like the neck curve up here at the top will look similar to the low back here. The middle's left over from the old, and the sacrum here, all separate bones until we're 25 years old, and looks like we're definitely all older than 25 here, is all one bone at that point. So there's two curves that are left over from the fetal curve, the sacrum down here and the mid back here. And then we have two developmental curves or secondary curves or what they call lordotic curves that are in the neck and the low back. And I think one of these next slides comes up. Well, let's jump ahead to where these slides are that show the picture of that. Like that. So that's what we're looking for. Okay? I'm going to come backwards again. Looks like this is working best from this side. These are some of the problems that you can get when you have poor posture while in your seated, while in a seated position. These are the areas to look at the back, the legs, the hand, the head position. 
and down there it says neck. And then the next slide will talk about different kinds of symptoms you can get. Back problems, neck problems, shoulder problems, headaches, and eye strain. So if everybody can, carpal tunnel syndrome, one of the most common these days. Why do you think there's a lot of carpal tunnel syndrome right now? Keyboards. Keyboards, exactly. And texting, holding cell phones close. Um, carpal tunnel syndrome, does anyone know what carpal means? You hear carpal tunnel syndrome, you think the whole thing's bad. Bone yeah, the bone segments. There's eight bones in your wrist. They're called carpal bones. That's the name, the anatomy. That's the name of them. And they make two rows of four. Meaning you take, like, picture taking like four weirdly shaped marbles, so to speak, and putting them in a horseshoe shape, and then making another row of that back to back. And then a ligament around this part. A lot of people know there's a ligament here. Right, because people cut here when they're like they shouldn't be, <laughs> and uh, that hole becomes what's called a tunnel. So it's a carpal tunnel. Inside that carpal tunnel is a median <coughs> nerve, artery, <coughs> vein, fat, fluid, muscle tendons, and these forearm muscles. Everybody, take your hands and take one hand, hold your forearm like this, and then wiggle your fingers like this, like you're typing. Can you feel what's going on in your forearm? All those muscles are moving and wiggling. Now if you do that over and 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 over again, guess what's going to happen? What happens to muscles when you do it over and over and over and over and over again? They get tired, they get fatigued, they get bigger. And if they get bigger and stuck bigger, so that they feel tight, like, do you mind if I touch your forearm? Does it feel tight like right in there? That tightness is what I'm talking about, whereas here, not so bad. When these muscles get tight here at the forearm, then the tendon that it becomes, not only is the muscle too big, but the tendon that that muscle becomes, the tendon's too big. When that tendon pushes up against the nerve, guess what we end up with? Pain. And if it happens to be the median nerve, you get carpal tunnel syndrome. If it happens to be the ulnar nerve, you get ulnar syndrome. If, it, if the muscle happens to be pushing on your piriformis muscle on your sciatic nerve, you get sciatica. So, a lot of this stuff, is, I guess what I'm leading to, is, is very preventable with just doing some simple things with I'm going to teach you in a moment. And then if, if you already have the problem or you need it to be loosened up by someone else, that's what I do. And usually most people, when they have these back problems, carpal tunnel syndrome, headaches, neck problems, most of them start getting results within three to six days. One week, two weeks of care, they usually do better. And uh, let's get back to how this curve developed. So. Next down, low backs curve like that. If you're, say you, say you're a person, remember in the old days they say, well my son or daughter walked faster than everyone in the whole neighborhood. And they just like brag about that. You know, they develop faster. Well what happens is if you walk too soon, this neck curve may not be developed properly. And they've done some neurological studies that shows that may, that may be the beginning of some people that have mild dyslexia difficulty learning, uh, anxious, uh, from walking too soon, right? Also, the curve in the neck that should have developed is straighter than it should be, right? So if I took something that's supposed to be curved, if I took a curve, and then I measured from the top to the bottom the distance there, we'll say maybe that's five inches from top to bottom, and I straighten it, How's, how big is the distance from top to bottom? It gets six, seven. Six, seven. It gets bigger. What happens to muscles when you stretch them out of place where they don't belong? They get swollen. They get tight. They get fatigued. That could be the beginning of headaches all by itself. So when you are setting up a desk area, like we're going to go through in a moment, or a seat, where should your monitor be or your work be or the things that you're reading be? Should it be down at the desk so that that curve that should be curved like this straightens out? Or should it be straight ahead of you? Right. So this is the kind of concepts we're going to go over. Exactly like that. I want everybody to take out those surveys that you have. So there's a page, page that looks something like this. And you can fill them out if you like. You don't have to. Don't feel obligated to. Uh, the reason why I give you these is so you can give you some visual of what I have here. Some people have to see it up close. But also, if you decide 
that you wanted to come in and you don't want to set up one of the appointments in the back there, which are really easy to set up, then you can just circle this at the bottom, put your phone number on it and hand it to me or leave it at the front and say, just call me. I don't know my schedule right now, but give me a call and I'll, I'll set it up with you. But by a show of hands here on this survey, I want to get an idea. How many people have headaches? How many people in the last six months have been dealing with headaches? So I got to get an idea. I'm going to design the, these exercises around what you guys have. So it's just three people. There's three people in the whole room that got headaches in the last six months. Yeah. Are you guys all divorced or something? You got no headaches anymore? <laughs> my, wife, my wife has headaches. Also. Your wife has headaches. Right. You can pass this on to your wife. Maybe we can get rid of her headaches. <laughs> oh boy, these guys know each other's wives. Look out. <laughs> how many people have shoulder problems? Give me an idea by show of hand. How many people have shoulder? Okay. So the shoulder problem, people can raise their hand. That's interesting. The headaches can't lift their arms, and the shoulder people can. Oh, it's the other hand. Gotcha. That makes sense. How about wrist problems like carpal tunnel syndrome? How many people are dealing with carpal tunnel syndrome? One, two, three. Okay. How about knee problems? Yep. So, so far, knees is the most. How about hip problems? Okay. If they have it, they say hip, hip, or right? Some say hip, hip, or right, but they don't jump up. <laughs> How about ankle problems? Ankle. Elbow? Empty wallet syndrome. <laughs> Speaking of empty wallet syndrome, which back pocket should you keep your wallet in when you sit down? <laughs> How many people have, their back, have a wallet in their back pocket right now as we're sitting? Because if I left it on the table, I, I was, I was, I was going to say something about leaving on the table, but in this group someone might take it. I don't know. So picture this. You got a wallet in your back pocket and you're trying to figure out why your butt might hurt, your low back might hurt, or your hips might hurt. Did you ever think maybe it's from sitting on the wallet? How many people just started sitting on their wallets in the last couple weeks versus the last 50 years? Right? So you've been sitting on a wallet for 50 years trying to figure out why you have back pain. I got it in my front pocket. Smart man. Now, if you decide to change it, which one of the best things you could do as far as sitting in a class right now like we're doing, learning about how to stay fit when you sit, one, take your wallet out, take all the money, leave it on the desk over there and put, this is for Dr. Yorker because he just saved me a lot of money and back problems by just taking the wallet out of my, no, I'm take, literally take the wallet out of your back pocket when you're sitting and put it in your front pocket. If it's too thick right now, you can wait an extra five, 20 minutes to get home and do it and empty out what you don't need in there. And find a new wallet when someone says, oh, Hanukkah came around, they're my gifts, I need something. Oh, you have everything. Get me a thinner wallet so I can put it in my front pocket. You guys took all my money already. Something like that. Literally, put the wallets in your front pocket if you sit. Um, make sure if you take it out, you put it somewhere safe so when you lose it, it's not my fault. You're like, I had it in my back pocket until I started moving my wallet around. And that Dr. Yorker, I lost my wallet because of that guy. Um, but it's very important. And I want you to start thinking of those kind of ideas. Because these are the kind of things that can save your back. And don't just put it on the other side. Like some people are like, oh, if I've been using it in my back pocket on the left for 50 years, maybe I should just put it on my right back pocket. How many people have jeans that actually have marks in their back pocket of like where their wallet was? Right, that's it. So imagine what it's doing to your body if it's marking up your jeans. <laughs> right, okay. Um, so that gives me an idea what kind of, uh, so those of you that have circled stuff on there or just aware that there's a problem, if you, when you come in to talk to me about it, obviously we're going to review them again, but uh, you can circle them on there and write down, you know, I'd really like to see you, blah, 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 you told me the consult's free, I have a Medicare card anyway, blah, 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 and we'll help you fix all those problems. Uh, let's see. What, he moved his wallet already? Smart man. Who was it? Who was it? Who was the one? Okay. Smart man. The doctor, probably, that guy. Okay. Having a little technically difficulties here, right? Try to get my slides to go. Oh, no, you're right. Da, 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 da. The remote is the pain. Uh, can you turn the light on? Because maybe we'll just do it without this. I can show you the rest. Okay. There we go. I always have a plan B. When I public speak, I always plan Bs. We do a lot. It looks like my battery might be having its day. Uh, yeah, why don't you do it? Can you? Give me the next one. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and the next one, we use a different survey. We're beyond that slide. Give me one more. Keep going with that next. And then the next. And then the next. Okay, so this is a close-up view of that plastic spine that I was showing you. 
We have what's called the body of the vertebra, the spinous process, that's the part when you see someone's skinny, you can think you can see their spine. And then in between each of the bones is a disc, which is the cartilage. How many people are dealing with disc problems? It's one of the things that's great about this uh, instrument is you can adjust spines that have disc problems with an instrument like that. Now, the disc's supposed to be thick, filled with some fluid. What does it do? It gives you some separation between the two bones. Has anyone gotten shorter, shorter in the last 10, 20 years? Yeah. Why do you think that is? Because the posture's like this, absolutely. But also, the cartilage here. There's a fluid in here. It's 31 of them. How many millimeters are an inch? 2.54, right, approximately 25, 26. There's 31 of these discs. Centimeters, correct. Uh, uh, 2.5 centimeters, like 25 millimeters, thank you. The, um, imagine if you lost one millimeter in each one of these discs, 31 of them. How, many, how, much, how, how, much inch, how, many, how, how much height did you just lose in inches by losing one millimeter? One About one and a quarter inches, just by losing one millimeter in each of these discs. So you want to make sure you drink a lot of water. You, there are some supplements that can help hydrate those called glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate. Just if you take them, make sure you're not allergic to fish. Um, it's, it's made out of shellfish and stuff like that, that's why. And they do make some that aren't, but they're not quite as effective. Um, and over time, they get smaller. They just get thinner. Now, what happens behind these discs, you may not be able to see from there, but you can come take a look at it later, is behind the discs are where the holes are that the nerves come out. So, all the nerves that come out of your low back control everything in the leg. The nerves that come out of your lower neck control everything in the arm. If the discs are getting thinner, or the curve is off and pulling the muscle, or the bones are misaligned and not moving properly, what do you think is going to happen to that nerve that comes out of the hole? Pinched. Gets pinched, exactly. And what happens when you have a pinched nerve? It says, it says, ouch, and then eventually it doesn't say ouch. It actually eventually doesn't hurt anymore. Right? Has anyone ever had a pain before and it went away? all by itself? Did it ever come back again and then it went away again? Came back again and went away again? Sometimes they repeat and come back, sometimes they don't. But a misalignment is a misalignment and you can actually have mental impulses, meaning nerve impulses, sent to areas of the body and not give you any pain. A lot of the time we think of the worst problems as pain, but like for instance, because some of you guys are doctors in the area, how long does it usually take for like cancer to cause pain? A long time, right? So people say, uh, it hurts here, I think it's cancer. Like, well, if it hurts, it's already too late sometimes, right? Because cancer is, doesn't hurt, it goes undetected, right? You have lymph nodes that, that hurt. Is that a good sign or a bad sign when you're talking about cancer? You have a lymph node that hurts. Usually the ones that don't hurt are the ones you're worried about. A matted down one in the breast tissue that doesn't hurt, they're like, okay, we've got to get an eye on that. So, meaning pain is not the only judge for health. But if you're getting pain, Something's going on, and pain doesn't just, it, it, it can go away on its own, but the problems don't always go away on their own. The pain just goes away. Because a lot of time the pain is the most recent thing you feel. You ever have a new pain and you go, ow, that hurts. It must have been from what I just did yesterday. But it couldn't have been from sitting eight hours a day for the last 55 years, right? We always think it's the last thing we did. But sometimes it could be something we're doing all the time. Can you give me the next slide, please? This is what a healthy one looks like. A lot of people do this at the desk. This is exactly what I'm talking about. How many people have done this before? How many people are doing it right now? As we speak, we do that, right? They call it the thinker. <laughs> well, he could get a wrist problem from this. He can get an L problem from this. He can get a shoulder problem from this. He can get a headache from this. He can get eye pain from this, neck pain from this, low back pain. Just from this, just looks like something we all do. It on. And it's okay to do it once in a while. Just be aware that that's not a resting position. That's a, I need to be taking a rest position. This person's ready for a break. They shouldn't be struggling and keep on going like that. They should be standing up, changing their position, taking an actual break. Can I get the next slide, please? Okay. So we're going to kind of, and again, because uh, there's a lot of information we could talk in reference to this, but we're probably going to finish up with this slide here, okay? Because this is probably the most important one because I brought a woman into the picture. <laughs> what I want you to take note of here is the sitting. Staying fit when you sit. That's what Tay's about. The angles of her body. Come on, guys. No, not those parts. Not the, not the curves of her body. The angles of her body. I want you to look at her head position. So, when we're looking at the joint angles, I focus on feet. And I picked this picture on purpose because she happens to be wearing heels, which I'll talk about in a moment. Knees, hips, 
elbow, wrist, elbow, shoulder, and of course the head position. I call it the rule of 90s. Does everyone know what a nine? Does anyone not know what a 90 degree angle is? Right, it's a right angle, a 90 degree angle, like the corner here, the corner of the TV set, corner of this sign, corner of this screen. Not that, not up there. Her ankle's not at a 90 degree angle, but typically we're going to start at the feet when we set up a desk and a seat height. So when we're sitting in our seat, anyone not sitting? Take a look where your feet are. I want you to move your feet into such a way so that you're sitting in it with your feet at a 90 degree angle. Good. And then I want you to do the same thing with your knees. Bring them to a 90 degree angle. Now obviously it's never going to be exactly 90, so you want to be 90 degrees or a little bit more. I know some of you can't see me in the back, but 90 degree angle at the feet, 90 degree angle at the knees. How many people while sitting are noticing that they can't get their feet at a 90 degree angle? If it's too little, you already know why yourself. I'm too tall for this seat. If it's too much, it's because you're too, seat, too short for the seat. You follow me? You already know this as you're doing it yourselves because you sit in seats all the time. You're either noticing that you're really low in the seat because you're too tall or too tall in the seat and you can't touch the ground because you're too short. The knee also, 90 degree angle. Your arms on the armrest. Put your elbows at a 90 degree angle. For the, from someone that's about 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 10, these chairs are probably made perfect for you. You'll start to notice, hey, my ankle's already at a 90 degree angle. My knees are at a 90 degree angle. I put my shoulders back, rest my elbows on here, I'm at a 90 degree angle at the elbow. And then you're thinking, yeah, I am 5'6", I am 5'8", I am 5'9". The 90 degree angles are how you start up setting up your desk at home. So I want you to think about the chairs and the desks that you sit at at home. Are they too low? Are your ankles at less than a 90 degree angle? Are your knees at less than a 90 degree angle? Are your elbows up here? Is your desk up here? So you'll be sitting, ankles 90, knees 90, hips 90. If your arms are resting on armrests, elbows 90. Hands will go where? Right on the keyboard or right on the book or right on the, or right on the writing area. And then your head will be straight ahead. You're allowed a 15 degree head tilt down or a 15 degree head tilt up. Just 15 degrees. Kind of like if you could take that light again, that would be great. So now, what do you do if you don't have the right seat height or desk height? You know, you could, if, you have enough, if you have an adjustable chair, you can adjust it. If you, if you have a lot of money and you like to buy furniture, you could go buy a new one. If you work for someone else, you could complain to the boss. If you are the boss, you'd be afraid to take me into your company because you think that the 150 employees are now going to all want new chairs after this class, <laughs> which is not the truth. Because what you'll notice is there's always a way to rig up what you already have. Okay? Uh, again, you can go buy something, but before you even do something like that, try to alter what you have. Some chairs are adjustable. This one adjusts at the handle. She's got an adjustment here for the back. She's got an adjustment here for up and down, but not every chair is like that, like the one you're on. At home, it might not be the same way. Now, this person's wearing heels. This is a perfect example of how if you're, if you're a woman that wears heels, I, gotta watch, I guess these days, men, the men, anyway, I'll, I'll stay out of that. Um, if you are at a chair and your seat's too high, what can you do instead of getting a brand new chair? You could put your feet up on something. Now, if you're a woman, you could put them in high heels and you're handled look glamorous going to work, you got your high heels on, feet are now touching the ground, but if you wore flats, what's an idea of something you could do that you already have near your desk? Books. You could put books on the floor. You still might get a yellow pages mailed to you once in a while. You could use those. You could put your wallet if it's really big. <laughs> um, shoe box, something to get your feet up on it so that your feet are at a 90 degree So I want you to kind of think about that way, not just automatically, oh, I need to go buy a new chair. It's all screwed up no matter my back's bothering me, my ankles bother me. But go sit at what you have. See, start from the bottom. Alter the bottom in some way. Then start to the knee, then go to the arms, then go to your desk height. And if you get to the point where you can't do this on your own from just what we went over, have someone take a picture of yourself, bring it with you when you come to the office. I'll show you how you can alter that. I'll show you. There's always a way to do it. And then, real important, where, you're working is, where your work is that you're looking at, what you're staring at. 
all, many of us, besides eating, we're looking down. We, we look down when we do our work. So we're going to be altering that neck position. It's going to cause headaches in the long run or fatigue up in the neck and shoulders. Get your materials straight ahead of you. Make sure the monitor is straight in front of your eyes. If you have, how many people have two monitors when they do their work? Well, it's kind of common now, right? Is it up and is it one stacked on top of the other or are they side by side? Most people do them side by side. Side by side is not ideal. Ideal would be stacked so that the bottom of the, so you put one monitor at the top, one monitor below it, the eye level, your actual eye level seated will be right in the middle at the bottom of the top and the top of the bottom. So the bottom of the top screen, top of the bottom screen, looking right at that center line. So when you do your head tilt up, you're looking 15 degrees up at the top screen, head tilt down, looking at the bottom screen. And then if you're looking at books or paperwork, you can lean that on the bottom screen, or maybe there's still a little bit extra space below it. Or if you just have one monitor, and you're, say you have one monitor, and then you're looking at something that's on paper, or looking at a book, or looking at something else as you look at the screen back and forth, back and forth, use a clipboard or lean it up against a book or get a music stand. They make music stands. We always think of music stands as they're tall, but you could just take the top off and lean it right up on there. Some of you used to play instruments. You're like wondering what they need. Your wife's telling you to throw that music stand away. It's in the way. Tell me you need it for work. Um, but so that you're looking down and up this way, 15 degrees, not left and right. Um, I'm going to soon finish up with some exercises, but I figured, let me take some questions in case you guys have any questions before I move forward with that. You can pop the lights on. Thank you. Okay. Yes? Uh, someone's sitting in my home in a dining room table. Yes. A dining room chair. Uh, if I want to be a good host, I'll give her a pillow if her back is bothering her. That's right. To give you a little extra support here. Okay. In the long term, uh, uh, in the short term, it makes her more comfortable. Yes. But if she continues, in the long the, term of any, the in the long term of assisting anything with a bracing, uh, it has the potential to weaken. So in the short term, so we're sitting, right? We could lean forward and lose our curve, or we could sit up and potentially have our low back curve. And something that can help if someone's uncomfortable, like my forum is, is to give them a pillow. You could roll up a towel or have a pillow or a special pillow to fill in this space. I think overall it's a good idea. If you're going to be doing it for dinner, how long do you usually eat dinner for? Me? Yeah, all day. Like me. <laughs> how long does she eat dinner for? At least in public. <laughs> I wasn't looking at it. A half hour, 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half. So that much time, if she did an hour a day of sitting with the pillow, it's fine. What, what, but if you were going to do it at the desk all day, and you find that you need that pillow all day, to ha it's fine to have the support. But if you find that you have the support and you still have back pain, then you have to strengthen those muscles. You've got to figure out what's not moving properly in your what back. What about the lumbar in the cars? I think it's a great idea to keep it pumped up to some level to fill in the space, but the best thing you can do is change it and alter it. Like some cars change and alter, you know, like the, I don't know if the, like some, some cars you can hit a button and it moves. Does anyone have any of those cars where it pulses? Mercedes does it. Other, yeah, but it just, you can hit a button and it actually constantly changes. Like it alters. Yes, does that help? Does that answer your question? Yes. He said, how about the guy that's bent over and spitting? <laughs> how about the guy that's bent over, stuck like that? Is that a problem that's a condition? Is that the question you asked? Is that a vertebrae condition? It can be a lot of different things. First thing, I, first thing I think of when I think of somebody who's bent over like that, when you see them walking down the street and they're bent over, is it didn't happen overnight unless it was a major trauma. Someone dropped the piano. And so, a major trauma. Okay? <laughs> Sorry for the bad jokes. They just slip out. They're unfiltered. Uh, um, so something gradually changed over time. Maybe they had a job, like literally, this is, this is not a joke, maybe they had a job where they like, were cave digging as a job. Maybe they're looking for money the whole time. Maybe they're really tall and they always bang their head. And there could be certain activities that they did that really looked down 
all day as their jobs possible. But most of the time, there was some bad posture along with some weakness in the muscles. Typically, the person that's going to be bent like this, there's a lot of muscles that support the bringing up, but we're looking at a tri mostly a triangular shaped muscle, um, really, that eventually makes a diamond on the back. Does anyone know which one I'm talking about already by saying it that way? So, there's a muscle that goes from here to the shoulders to this part of our back, and it's called the trapezius muscle. A lot of people know the trapezius muscle is up here, but the trapezius muscle goes like this to the shoulders and then like this all the way to this part of the back. So there's an upper, middle, and lower trapezius muscle. Okay. Um, in reference to that, I'm going to bring up the first exercise. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Now, it could just be that there's a cranial nerve that got injured that, cr that controls it. And that injury to that nerve might have caused it to happen. Or that muscle attaches to all these bones from where my one hand is to my other hand. Attaches on all those to the shoulder. Maybe one or two or three of those vertebrae are not moving properly, causing that muscle to not work the way it should. A really easy exercise you could do to strengthen that, okay, is to take any elastic. You don't need a, like a fancy one like this. All you need is a rubber band, which most people have rubber bands at their desk already, right? You take a rubber band, so say I have only that much rubber, literally. You take the rubber band and you just hold it there in your hands, bring it up against your chest like that, and without, you're, I'm purposely holding it so you don't see any blue. I'm holding it as if I'm holding a stick. So like for instance, if I held a pen, I can't bend it, right? I mean, I can break it, but it doesn't just naturally bend like rubber. So I'm holding this rubber piece, even if it's a rubber band, as if I'm holding something that's not bendable. It's a key item to this. People always later ask me, well, I just pull my thumb like that. I'm like, no, it's not the same. Or I just do it in the air. No, it's not the same. You want to hold something that your brain thinks you can bend, put it up against your body, and then squeeze your shoulders back. See how my hands don't move at all? I'm going to purposely turn to the side so you can see what's going on. And in the back. So I'm squeezing my shoulder blades together. The most important part of why this fixes things permanently is because it tricks your brain into thinking, it tricks your brain into using new neural pathways from your brain to the muscle. Meaning when you hold on to something elastic, the first instinct is you want to pull it. And, if you give someone clay, they don't just like hold it and look at it. They want to squeeze it. And so when you hold rubber, you want to bend it. When you hold rubber and you don't let your hands bend it, it's a brain game already. Now, how often do you squeeze your shoulders back without moving your hands one bit? Doesn't happen too often. Now you're creating brand new neural pathways that eventually just stand up straight. So if you caught that person early enough, or if you have family members or grandkids, you're like, stand up straight already. You got that posture of your grandmother. Da, 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 da. Give them this exercise instead of just torturing them. Go, this is how you'll fix it. <laughs> so you don't end up with the back like we all have in our family. Why, why wouldn't you use something that doesn't bend? Well, the reason why you don't use, the reason is if you use something that doesn't bend, you'll still get the physical strengthening of those muscles. So like for instance, the question is, why don't, what if I use the hard pen or pencil? Well the answer is, you're still going to strengthen the muscles, but you're not going to create as many neural pathways that are new from the brain to it. And a lot of people are aware of, if you know anyone or have had issues with strokes, or have had any issues with Alzheimer's, or had any issues with dementia, they talk about making new neural pathways. It used to be like when we were kids, they told us that our brain cells, you're born with a certain amount and then they die and that's all you get. But now they have finally learned that we don't use all our brain cells. And if you do new things, you'll stimulate. It's called neuroplasticity. It's called a rebirth of a cell. So you're actually, you're actually birthing brain cells that are sitting dormant in your brain. And, uh, and those new pathways will create new posture, even if you've had it your whole life. And it also slows down things like memory loss and stuff like that. Yes. Scott, thank you for presenting to the Men's Club of South Jersey. Thank and I you. can't wait next month until your father talks about neurology. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be the example. <laughs> I do have a question about medical for myself. Sure. Uh, I'm having trouble uh, sleeping at nighttime, and it's affecting my shoulder. I sleep on one side, then I have to go to the other side. Mm -hmm. I know it's going, I'm going to have a shoulder problem. I'd like mm -hmm. to listen to how many people have that problem in this room. Uh, but how should I, I, if I get those stupid neck pillows and I can't sleep on my back yep. too long, what do you recommend to solve this problem? Well, how many people are, how many people are side sleepers? 
<laughs> Those are the people that are going to have a problem with side sleeping. <laughs> and, not, and not just to be sarcastically answered, but like we shouldn't sleep on our side. I know it's hard. Um, so, so one thing you can do is switch back and forth. Because some people sleep on their side, they never switch, right? That's one thing. Another is, by doing this exercise before bed, or when you awake or both, you'll start to train the muscles to come back. And you might surprise yourself. You're dealing with a game of millimeters. You may surprise it just by doing a little bit of exercise before you go to sleep. will actually strengthen those muscles to hold them back even when you're a side sleeper. And then, when you're on, so one answer is strengthen the muscles just like I showed you. The other is, when you're using a pillow and you're lying on your side, uh, they make custom pillows for this, but they're very expensive. You can take a thin pillow you already have and a couple um, uh, terry cloth towels, and you can rig one to make this happen. You want to measure the distance from your shoulder to your neck and measure the distance from your shoulder to your head. The neck's usually a little longer than the neck as far as that distance. You take a pillow and you find the amount of thickness of a pillow where you can lie on your side and fill all that space in. Can you visualize that? Okay. It's something we do, I do with people in the office all the time. And usually what I'll do is I have like this grid on the wall. It's like a blue grid. I take a picture of you and then we measure it. And you can either go home and measure your pillow and go, okay, that's what, I mean. that's what he's talking about. Or you just bring the pillow in with a couple towels and we do it right there in the office and you take it home with you. And, uh, but the best recommendation is going to be to sleep on your back. But if you can't, those are the two other options. Squeezing exercise and the proper side pillow. Not the one that they say is the best one on TV because it's the best one. The one that's actually molded for you. Either get one that's pri that is, they make them. You can have one that is actually molded for you. It's, it's designed for you. Like, like, like we make orthotics in the, sh in, in, in the office for shoes. We make pillows for you. They're very expensive. So expensive I don't even recommend them. The towel will do most of what it needs. When you're sleeping on your back, yes. you should be laying flat. You should be flat with a little bit of support under this part of the neck. So a lot of times they have these pillows that have like these little... Um, they have these pillows that give you like uh, extra support, right? It has this kind of shape to it. And you want to make sure that that's when you're lying on your back, that there's one bone. If everybody reaches back here, you can feel that one bone that sticks out the most right about here. You feel that bone? It's called the vertebral prominence. Is that one right there. You can kind of see how it sticks out more than all the others. You want the, yeah, exactly, C7 and, and T1. You want the, the um, the peak of that support, the thickness of wherever that next support is, on that part. So a lot of people put the thickness here, not here. If you put it here, what will happen is your head will fall back on it. And that's going to help correct the neck. So if you have an adjustable bed, yes. do you, you just like leave it flat? Or leave I would leave it flat and then I would get a little extra support under that part of the bone. You could do it with just a pillow roll, like take a towel and roll it up, or a very thin pillow with a, with a pillow roll in it. So what's the, these adjustable beds? That the adjustable beds, uh, I think, help people with snoring a lot. Uh, they help them sit up if they want to watch TV in bed. Uh, acid reflux. That's what they're for. They like spending extra money on their bed. The mm -hmm. wife wanted it. They thought it was a good idea. <laughs> yes. The microphone throws me off. I don't know where it's coming from. There we go. <laughs> Lately, you hear a lot about what they call cell phone syndrome. Yeah. Could you talk about that a little bit? Um, well, there's texting syndrome, which is like overuse of the thumbs. Meaning repetitive use syndrome, almost like carpal tunnel syndrome, except with the thumbs. And then you have people that hold their phones like this. Someone made a noise like they can already tell that's a bad idea. How about if you're, if you're constantly looking down? Constantly looking down. That's exactly right. That's exactly what we're talking about. It should be straight ahead of you. Ideally, it should be like you're taking a selfie of yourself, even though it's something I don't do. <laughs> I mean, you see people do it, but with two hands. It should be up here. You're so, ideally, we should be looking at our phone straight ahead of us. Uh, Scott, yeah. good question. I know uh, a lot of people work long hours. Oh, sorry. 
long hours on their computer, but I always found it best, since I'm a little bit of a twitch anyway, to get up like every 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, yep. and just stretch, walk around. I have steps, go up and down the steps till I broke my ankle. And <laughs> I wouldn't feel well until that happened. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just wonder, is maybe that's even a, be a better method than trying to remember. I mean, it'd be nice to combine the both. You do. You lead right into it's a great question. Again, his question led right into some exercises. His question ran right into some exercises, and this one does also. Um, you want to, when you're sitting, you don't want to sit longer than 45 minutes without getting up ever. So getting up every 20 to 30 minutes, great idea. You don't want to go every. You don't want to go longer than 45. This even goes for when you're driving in a car long distances. You should be setting yourself a little extra time, so that every 45. Most people set it. They drive until they either go to the bathroom or get gas. We're not stopping until the gas is low. We're not stopping until someone's got to pee. You got to pee again. <laughs> you, know, you, you know this on, on cars. You should set the game plan so you're actually stopping every 45 minutes. It doesn't have to be a long break. It could be just changing the seat position because it's not safe to get out of your car. It's a blizzard outside, you're in the middle of a dangerous neighborhood, you're on a highway, the cars are going a gazillion miles an hour. You don't just get out of the car in an unsafe area, of course, but if you can get out of the car in a safe area, then you get out of the car. You take a walk around the entire car, get back in and go. It doesn't have to be go take a long break, take a walk. 30 seconds to 60 seconds, like I put in that packet there, um, will give you a really a good enough break to help with blood flow, to help with the knees, to help with the feet, to help with the eye strain, to help with headaches. And another exercise you can do, um, if, you, if you just don't have the time to get, maybe you're in a job where if you get up every 45 minutes, your boss is gonna like fire you. Who knows, this is an example. Meaning maybe you're in a situation, you don't want that job. You, you don't want that job. But, like, but maybe you're in a situation where you just can't get up out of your chair for every, maybe you're just not allowed out of the chair. So one of the exercises you can do that I gave you, and then I'll take your question next, is, um, and it's in that packet, so right on the first page, is to make sure your seat is a safe seat, and then you slide yourself down and try to straighten your whole body out while you're sitting in the seat. 30 to 60 seconds. Just make sure the seat you're on is safe. And, and bring your arms up like this. If you do this for like 30 seconds every 20 minutes, you'll have so much longer longevity and energy to continue with your work just doing something like that. And you can do that right in the chair. Next question. Close your mouth. The uh, question is, uh, you bent over. Is there any treatment for osteoporosis? That's a good question. Um, Someone had mentioned about the bending over, and I did not bring up diseases. I only talked about the posture. But one of the things that can happen, uh, I think it was you that mentioned, like, what if you want. One of the things that some people that are bent over like this, part of what has happened is uh, their bones became brittle, and they got something called a compression fracture from the brittle bone. When you get a compression fracture, 90% of the time it happens on this part of the bone. It doesn't happen here. The wisdom of the body, which is nice, the back part of these bones, the back part of the body, just button up against where the, where the uh, spinal cord is, and the back part of the bones here, where, uh, on the other side where the spinal cord is, they tend to stay hard no matter what. It's the body of the bone that becomes brittle over time. And if that breaks, it'll create a wedge shape. So you can kind of see how these are, I'll pick the bottom ones. They typically happen in here, but as an example, the bottom ones are bigger. See how it's almost like square block shaped when you look at it from the side? The fronts will crush, and then it creates like a V wedge, right, where the back's still whole, and the front is a point. And if you take those vertebrae and they start to wedge forward like that, eventually you can have compression fractures creating that posture. Now what can you do about it? For osteoporosis, is there anything for that? Well, eventually osteoporosis will become that. What you do in advance of it, you want to make sure that you strengthen the muscles because there's something called Wolf's Law, which means that if you put pressure on a bone from muscle, the bone becomes stronger. So the most important thing is just to stay total body active. Um, and then there's, uh, you want to make sure you get enough calcium, enough vitamin D uh, in, a, in a proper ratio, um, and you want to hydrate. And then, um, it, 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 there's some debate about this, but you want to make sure that your diet is digesting in, in mostly an alkaline level. Is there any treatment? There's drugs that slow it down. Yeah, exercise, 
if it's real bad, there's drugs that can slow down the process, and you exercise. Is there any specific exercise? I haven't, I haven't looked Total body. Total body exercises. Because you need to put strain on every bone that's potentially osteoporotic. Any specific? Because I'm looking on the internet, and I haven't seen any... It's total body. Total body. Everything. You want to do exercises for every body part. There's not a specific... There, and anything, that's called, anything that's called a core exercise, good for that. Anything that's called a postural exercise, good for that. Any of the ones that I'm going to show you here today, good for that. Does that help you answer your question? Meaning it's a total body exercise. Pilates is good. Yoga is good. Uh, swimming is good. You got to make sure you strengthen every single muscle. Um, just to final, uh, sum up on that nutrition stuff, which someday I may do a program here on nutrition if you guys want. I do them for the, oh, I do different programs every month at the JCC that are no cost. You can kind of keep, it's a, there's flyers around. You can always just ask the JCC or call me and find out what's going on next. Um, the next one we're doing is on how to fire up your metabolism. It's going to be me and a dietary. It's a woman who does dietary medicine. She's a medical doctor who does dietary medicine. And it's going to be how to fire up your metabolism. We're going to talk a lot about exercises to increase metabolism. She's going to go over foods um, and medication. Um, but if you eat foods that digest as an acid more than foods that digest as an alkaline, alkaline is another word for base, over time, calcium is an alkaline mineral. So if you eat too many acidic foods over the long haul, your body will start to drain calcium as one of the minerals out of your body to neutralize your own nutrition. And it could be healthy stuff. You could be eating healthy proteins. You could be eating healthy fats. You could be eating healthy carbs. If they're digesting as an acid, like proteins digest into amino acids, carbs break down into triglycerides and fatty acids, Fat breaks into fatty acids. If it's acid, 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 digestion, and you're not eating enough fruits and vegetables to digest as an alkaline, over time it takes body parts from you. Calcium from the bone, magnesium from the muscle, sodium from the nervous system and the electrolytes. And so one of the things you can do as an overall good thing for just general health is to eat a diet that's mostly alkaline. Doesn't mean you have to be a vegetarian if that's not your thing, but you want to make sure that most of your foods digest as an alkaline. If you're not sure what I mean by that, it's not how it tastes, meaning a lemon is acidic, but it digests as an alkaline. So if you're not sure what foods digest as an alkaline, just write this down, acid ash foods, and put that into a search engine in the computer. You'll get charts and charts of foods, and you'll see, okay, this food digests nine, this digests eight. Any food that digests over seven is an alkaline food, and you want to eat more of those compared to the others. Do we have enough time for more questions? One more question. Uh, I'm in need of an entirely new skeletal system. Uh, we have trade-ins back there. Because, because I have arthritis throughout. Okay. You haven't mentioned the word arthritis. No. Um, can whatever you do for us, is that uh, based on solely muscular problems or the arthritic problem? It's a great, it's a great question. Um, the, there's so many things that can happen to the spine, including arthritis. And arthritis is not just spinal, it's, it can be to any joint of the body. There's two major categories. You have your osteoarthritis, which is your wear and tear stuff. Then you have your rheumatoid arthritis, which is a systemic disease, and there's thousands of types. Um, so it's, it's a class in and of itself. However, to answer your question, the results of osteoarthritis, meaning what you now have, is it osteoarthritis that you're talking about? Okay. Uh, you can't reverse that. Like osteoarthritis on some level is an x-ray finding. It's an imaging finding. There's inflammation and there's something you can see on a picture that does not change. If it took you 40 years to get it, it'll take you about 80 years to get rid of it and then you do the math. <laughs> Literally. I mean, just, if it was going to potentially go away, it takes twice as long for it to go away as it created, if it was even potential. That means you'd have to have everything perfect and a chance of it reabsorbing. Occasionally it happens. There'll be a little stone of arthritis in a muscle, in a joint, fix the joint mechanics over time, it reabsorbs. But if it's actually attached into your spine, what's important to be aware of is that what caused the arthritis also causes pain. Okay? So if there's too much motion in a body part, it'll wear and tear and cause arthritis. If there's too little motion in a body part, it'll sit sedentary and cause arthritis. If it moves too much on one side than the other, it's dominant in a certain way compared to another, it'll create arthritis. Inflammation 
which happens whenever there's irritation in motion and, and irritation from foods and things, but we'll stick with motion right now, will cause scar, will cause adhesions, so inflammation pulling around will cause, inf will cause uh, adhesions, which will eventually cause scar tissue, which will eventually cause arthritis, okay? So, once you have the arthritis, you have it. It's like trying to, you ever have a big tree in Cherry Hill and it grew underneath the cement and you're like trying to figure out why, how, how do I get the cement to go back flat again? doesn't do it. You got you to gotta actually take the tree out. There's $2,000. <laughs> then you got to re-cement it and make sure if you plant a tree, you plant it further away from the sidewalk and so the next 50 years it doesn't happen again. I mean, once it's there, it's there. Okay. Now, what's very interesting is because the problems with mechanics in the joint cause arthritis and the problems with mechanics in the joint cause pain, there's a possibility that if you improve the mechanics, you can get rid of the pain that's associated with the arthritis without getting rid of the arthritis. You follow me? Okay. So you can drink water to lubricate. There's supplements like glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate and MSM that can assist because they have a hydrating affinity to bring water into the joint. But the most important thing you can do to get rid of the pain from the arthritis is to improve the motion. And that's exactly what chiropractic and physical therapy does. And there's more questions, but if anyone else has any other questions, two ways to do it, three ways to do it. One, call me anytime. I always answer, I, I always return the calls, but not always somebody answering, so I will return the call myself. There's appointment cards in the back. You just put your name and number on one half, take the other, and come in and ask it. You can write it on this sheet and then hand it to me, and I will call you back and let you know the answer, or I could stay after for a little while because I'll be downstairs in the Boomers program for the next five hours. You guys can come over to the Boomers program and ask me any question you want. We'll be in the back corner on the right next to the massage. Scott, Scott thank you for one quick thing. Do you have to be a member of the JCC to avail You do not need to be a member. And you can accept Medicare yes. and supplement. Yes, and most other insurances also. Thank you, thank you very thank much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Only forty dollars. We need more participation. Anyone else in the building? Next, uh, next meeting, we need to uh, put some money in the uh, 50 But anyway, forty dollars. Last three numbers. Last three numbers. Zero four zero. Last three numbers. Zero four zero.